Welcome to MOOC course on introduction to proteogenomics. Today we have a hands on session by Dr. David Fenio. In this session he will talk to you about some basic informations like how to open a file in R, how to transpose your data and how to run a command. A background knowledge in R will help you to understand these things much quickly. Next he will also discuss about how we can generate different kinds of plot and correlation study using R. Finally, he will discuss about binary classification model and how to plot a binarized copy number. So, let us welcome Dr. David Fenio for today's hands on session. You should start R studio, everyone should have that installed from previously um, and uh, then you need to do two things. One is to import the data and uh, if you can look at the PowerPoint yourself, I'll, uh, I'll show it quickly here but, then I'm, uh, but you should have the PowerPoint also so you can look at it, how you import the data um, and uh, it's the .txt file that's the data and the only thing that's important uh, to do when you import open the, uh, the data file is that you should change the name and call it X um, just for so that it's short and you should uh, click yes here on the heading so then it will uh, uh, take the sample names as uh, the column headings and you should select uh, use the first column as the row name. So, these are the G names. So, so the data is a small data set. So, it is the 77 breast cancer samples from CPTAC that you have seen already before. Uh, and I have all, uh, just done a small selection uh, of uh, uh, genes. So, uh, these are uh, from the bottom here there are five genes and these are the, uh, the protein levels that we measured and it's the log 2 uh, protein levels. So, it is ERBB2, ERBB4, GRB7, TBCB and TRIM65. Uh, so, those are the five uh, uh, protein measurements and then they have a value for each sample here. Um, and then the other thing we have is copy number. So, we have copy number only for ERBB2 uh, and we also I have binarized the copy number. So, I divided it into low and high. Uh, so, that is that's all the data and uh, then you just uh, click on import, uh, but if you do not for example, if you change do not change the name to X, it is going to be complicated uh, than later for you. Um, so, uh, uh, that is what you should see if uh, uh, after you import it, you should see x here, uh, there should be uh, seven, uh, 77 columns and uh, 7 rows um, and this is uh, showing a small part of it. Now, the next step is to open the, uh, the code which is the .r file and uh, then when you open the code you will see uh, this and we are going to go through uh, uh, that and oh yeah, so there is one more thing that is important is if you select a few lines um, and then click on here, I think I have seen the, uh, some people have it different ways that it says run maybe, um, but uh, that will then execute uh, the line that you have marked and you can mark several lines. So, now can anyone explain what this first line means? I am with, with uh, applying a function called t to x. So, x we can look at x it is where is it uh, here um, it looks like this. So, what is going to happen when we apply t the function t? Yes, yes. So, everyone knows what transpose is you guys have transposed it already 
and I will do it now. So like that. Now it appeared here. So uh, it uh, we can look at it and uh, it now has the gene names as columns and uh, uh, samples as rows. Then what we want to do is what we we're going to predict, try to predict uh, copy number. Uh, that uh, we could try to predict uh, that the samples that have a high copy number. Um, so we have this uh, column now in the transposed one, and we're going to say that any copy when uh, the copy number is smaller than uh, two, um, then it's low, and when it's larger than two, it's high. And this is now the, the log version uh, of it. So um, we can run these two and see that we get um, in the high, we have 16. So if you remember my slides from the presentation, there were a few, now, few dots. And it turns out that there were 16 that had high ERBB2 copy number. And, but most of them, 61, are low. Um, so now let's try our first plot. So you should see, definitely look here that there are 16 that have high copy number. You should get that, and 61 that have low. So this taking a subset uh, is very useful. And uh, we can, uh, that's something you will need uh, uh, very often. Um, and uh, so we just, so what this, notation means is that we take xt and then, but we're only interested in the ones where uh, the RBB2 copy number is less than two. And those we assign to a new variable that's called low. So we can actually, we can look at, let's look at the high because it's a little bit smaller. Uh, so the uh, high one now, we should only have 16 samples here, which uh, probably we have. So it's, um, this uh, um, now is a subset, uh, is a view of the overall table that has 77 samples, but uh, where we've selected only the 16 that uh, are uh, high copy number. So now we're just going to plot, uh, we define gene 1 as ERBB4. We just picked one out of the five uh, proteomics tracks. Um, and uh, we're going to plot on the x-axis, we're going to plot uh, ERBB4. Um, and on the y-axis, we're going to plot the copy number. Uh, so, and that plot is going to appear here. So now we see that we have x-axis is ERBB4. And the copy number is uh, um, uh, for ERBB2 on the y-axis. And we see that there are these, we know that there are 16 in our high uh, group, which are these here that have a higher uh, copy number. So we have those two. Um, so uh, now we can do one more thing here, is to um, color these in red. So uh, let me run it and then I'll explain it. So now all the ones we are considering high are shown in red. Uh, so uh, what we did is we first plotted everything in the black here in the plot command, but then we overlaid in red, but just for the ones that are in this, the 16 in this high group. So we have now uh, uh, separated them. You can put uh, search for maybe R points uh, and then you will get some and then it will show you that uh, that's what I did uh, yesterday that to set, define the color you uh, write uh, C-O-L short for color equal to red and the red has to be in quotations um, there are lots of other things you can do. You can change the shape of these. You can have them filled. Um, all that you can look up on the internet how to, uh, how to do. OK, so now we plotted copy number here. But we're really only interested if it's, the copy number is low or high. 
Um, so there is one other column. So here we uh, plot ERVB2.CNV, that column. But we have another one that uh, was ERVB2.CNV.binary. So now we're going to uh, plot uh, that. So it's the same plot, but we're changing from the actual copy number to either 0 if the copy number is low or 1 if it's high. Um, so then we run this. And now the y-axis will either be uh, 0 or 1. And the, all the red ones will be up here. Um, that have high copy, they will have uh, one, and the other ones will be uh, zero. So you remember in my lecture, I showed some uh, slides where we had exactly these kinds of plots. And then what we want to do is to find a threshold here uh, that um, uh, where we have most of the red points above the threshold and most of the black points below the threshold. Now, as you see, it's impossible to find a perfect thing for this, uh, but uh, let's try just one. So now there's a whole section here that we're going to run. We're going to uh, just uh, de define the threshold at 5, um, because all the black points are below 5. So we're going to run this and get another plot where we pl put the line here at 5, and then we see uh, we're going to get these, uh, define this low above, so the num that's the number of black points above the line, which is 0, um, low below, which is 61, which is all the black. Then we have from the high group above, we have uh, only 3, which is a bit disappointing, 3 out of 16. Um, uh, and that were classified right, and then 13 is below. So this is uh, not a good choice uh, of a threshold. Um, but so what I uh, want you to do is now um, uh, find a good threshold. Oh yeah, so this is another uh, Google search I did, is to how to plot um, with R. And you get a lot of different answers. So, and one uh, very nice thing is that they have a, a graph gallery that uh, shows different types of graphs. So you can look at the graphs and see, OK, I want to do that kind of graph. Then they have the code there. You can just copy and paste and modify it a little bit. Um, and so these will just now show the, exactly what we have done. Um, and then. If you remember one of the slides, what we have done now is actually uh, make a table like this. So uh, we, we had our actual groups, which uh, are uh, the zero would correspond to the low group, um, uh, the copy num uh, where ERBB2 copy number is low, and the one is when the copy number is high. And then the predicted group is when we set our threshold now at 5. Uh, so we get this uh, table. So what I want you to do now is to change the threshold and just find what you think is a good threshold to choose for this example. And this is for ERBB4. Then I want you to redo it for ERBB2 protein values, which of course are going to be better. That's what we expect, but also maybe try trim five, uh, trim sixty-five, um, and see find the, for each of these the best uh, uh, threshold. And also, if you have more time, you can explore uh, the, the, the to plot the data in different ways by looking here at the uh, uh, gallery. Yes. So so then, uh, when every time you try a new threshold, you get a table like this. Uh, so maybe fill out the table a bit uh, on paper and pen uh, and forever and try a few and then move on to from RBB4 to RBB2, which is going to give a better result because uh, there's, there's going to be more separation, not surprisingly, uh, because the copy number affects the, the, the same gene more. Um, but, uh, but as we saw, it's... Uh, uh, 
before I showed that RB before doesn't have a copy number chain, but it's still affected by the copy number chain in an indirect way. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's what I want you to do. And also, uh, trim 65 is uh, uh, negatively correlated, but not that strongly. So that will be, then the uh, red and the black will switch. It will be the other way around. Uh, but um, yeah, so, so that's just explore and think about, definitely think about what does it mean that the threshold is optimal. So what we want to, we want to get the values of these, um, these four values for every threshold. Um, so, uh, and we've calculated these um, for the copy number high, the ones that are above the threshold, uh, the, for the copy number high, the ones that are below the threshold. So, can anyone tell me where, so there are three that are above the threshold, these three here, um, of the copy number high, three of the red points. So where does that three go in the, um, in the, uh, in the confusion matrix? Which we have four different positions. Where would we put the number three here? Yes, true positives. So we put the three here, and then we have the copy number high below, which are the 13, and what are those? Yes, false negatives. So we put three in true positives and 13 in false uh, negatives. And then we have the copy number low, which uh, then are the other two. So we have um, the low above, which are zero, we, where does that end up? Uh, true negative, yes. Uh, no, sorry, uh, false, false positive, sorry, yes. So those are the false, so we don't have any false positives. And then the 61, the low below are the 61 uh, true negatives. And always with this, we want as many as possible on the diagonal and as few as possible uh, off the diagonal. Uh, let's say that we have uh, a very, uh, an additional test that we do uh, for all the uh, uh, positive ones that's rather quick and easy. Then we don't worry so much about false positives, then maybe we uh, can allow more false positive, but we are worried about the false negative. So it's not all the, but uh, the taking the sum is definitely one um, uh, option. So the other example is, let's say the consequence uh, of having a false positive is at, that the PhD student will um, spend five years investigating this protein. And then we, of course, want to have um, very few false positives. So it, it always depends on the situation. So uh, we had the high, the copy number high that are above the threshold. That's our uh, true positives. Um, and then we have the copy number high that are uh, below the threshold. Those are the false uh, negatives. Uh, then we have the uh, uh, copy number low uh, above. Uh, those are the false uh, positives. So in this case, with this initial threshold, we had no false positives. And then the copy number low that are uh, below are the true negatives. You should uh, try to find is to minimize the sum of the false positives and the false negatives. That, I think, for this case, we could call as the optimal case. But remember that that's not a general statement. That's, it will vary from case to case. So, so what you have done now is actually um, uh, uh, optimized a very simple machine learning um, uh, algorithm. 
it's probably the simplest machine learning algorithm one can imagine, but, but it's still uh, an algorithm that where we separate, um, uh, try to predict uh, what's uh, uh, positive and negative. And uh, so uh, the, the, what I want you to, people talk a lot about machine learning and it's, but, uh, and uh, there's a lot of hype, but there's no magic to it. This is it. I mean, this is really, when, if you understand this, um, the rest is just uh, 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 tricks to do it uh, better. So when you're calculating the threshold, optimal threshold, now based on that table, if you take the precision value, and uh, you want to get the most precise uh, values, can that be used as the point for calculating optimal yeah. pressure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, yeah. If you want to do that, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so I think this will this will kind of show this will kind of show the power of R. So. Uh, definitely. So what David or I am going to show you now, kind of show you the power of R. So David went through how you can manually fill out that that confusion matrix of the table. But the power of programming languages like R comes with the fact that you can fill that table out with a single line of code. And so now if you have to op optimize this, you have to do the table let's say 10 times. If you do it by hand, it's going to take you an hour. Uh, or maybe you're faster, but it's going to take you a long time. But you can very quickly do it with uh, 10 lines of code. And if you learn this thing called a for loop, you can do it with two lines of code. And it will automatically go through everything. If you want to calculate precision or you want to calculate accuracy or sensitivity, specificity, there are formulas based on that table. And R will automatically do those for you. There are functions that will calculate all those things. And you can do pretty much everything and you can even plot all the values as your threshold changes and then see where the maximum or minimum occurs. So that's the power of programming. So I think David and I were basically introducing you to what it can do, but uh, it, it provides power that goes way beyond what Excel or, or people can do. And like David said, it's all what we could do by hand, but if you do it by code, it's much faster. One thing, the more important thing is, the next time, two weeks later, you are trying to figure out what exactly you did, it will be there in code. If you did it in Excel, whatever you say is, is what you did before. So reproducibility in terms of uh, 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 remembering what you did and showing others what you did and in a publication making it uh, available to others is, is made much easier if you can code. I think that's where the power of programming comes. So I'll just show you how to create that table automatically and then I'll let you and Google deal with the rest. To do this, to do the table, you, you need to have two vectors, one that gives you the high and low based on copy number and the other that gives you the high and low based on this, this threshold that you have chosen. And so when you have these two vectors, you can call a function that will create that table for you. So the first vector... And then create another vector that says when it's when the gene is high and when the gene is low. And once you have these two vectors, it's a single line of code that will do the table for you. So basically what you need to do is you have to say high is one. So you just stick that and just copy it over. So I now have a variable called ERBB2CNV. Um, 
I just so I, I want to mark things that are more than two as one and so so this this statement is saying there is this vec, uh, uh, matrix called xt and I'm picking the erbb2 cnv column and if that column is greater than or equal to two then the boolean value is true in other words whenever that is true for any um, uh, uh, sample then that will have a 1 otherwise it will have a 0. So, it is just a different way of representing what David had before. So, if you look here, so now you can see uh, ERBB2 CNV is uh, logical and it has false, 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 true and so forth. So, for every sample it will say whether it was greater than 2 or less than 2. So, it now you have taken values and discretized it. So, it has become true or false. I will do the same for uh, the other I am going to set my threshold to 5, I will call it th. So, one of the tricks that our programmers use is to have names that are really small, so you do not have to type too much when you are writing code, <laughs> but that is not a good idea when you are writing code to keep, this is like just to try things out. When you are writing code to publish, if you have th then you do not know whether it was uh, uh, what it meant. So, then you need a longer name, but when you are just trying things out it helps to have smaller names. And so, now I am going to say ERBB4. This error means equal sign or something? No, the error happened because uh, I had an extra XT here. Oh, the arrow. Oh, the arrow means get the result and put it into some name. So, what I am saying here is so, this line is basically saying I have the number 5, I want to call it th. So, that way when I write code using th, I can go and change it to 3 and then next time I can run the same code and it will do it for 3 instead of 5. So, I used an equal to sign. Equal to sign is also the same. Yeah. Actually, equal to is a more newer uh, no. thing. They would not allow equal to in R before. Mm -hmm. I think, but the later versions allow equal to, but I am used to doing the less than minus. No. It's the same as equal to. Yeah. So I used equal to because I don't really know R. <laughs> <laughs> In many languages, it is equal yeah. to. And R, I think, realized that people are getting confused. So only recently they have allowed the equal to sign. Till then, it was the less than minus. So that shows that uh, uh, I'm I'm a little old. <laughs> so for the ERBB4 gene, I'm going to say I'm going to take the array XT and I want the gene ERBB4 and I want this to be greater than or equal to threshold in order for it to be called high. So, now for ERBB4 gene again you see here there are 77 things and they are all either true, false or some uh, true or false. So, you can even look at it by just typing the name here. So, now we save the result in ERBB4.gene. When, so, you can see for which sample it is true, for which sample it is false, it has the whole thing encoded in that one name. So, now all you need to do to get your table that uh, you did manually before is to say I want a table that compares uh, ERBB2 copy number and ERBB4 the gene. What did I call it? Yeah, yeah, I spelt it wrong the first time. So, these are things that you have to keep in mind. So, many of you had issues when you loaded the table for example, if you did not remove the column that said genes and make it the row name, then when you do the transpose of the matrix, the transpose works only when you have a real numbered matrix. So, there are all these quirks and debugging that you need to learn along the way. It is not like um, uh, as straightforward as one would think because the error that comes out does not really tell you what is happening or what is wrong. So, you need to kind of logically think through and do it, but you do it a couple of times you will you will get it. So, there is your table. So, you can see uh, the, the, the true false here is the predicted and the true false on the, in the rows are the actual. Uh, so, in, in our case the this is for the copy number and this is for the gene. And so, you can this is the treble that you manually created by counting dots before. So, now let us say I want to change the threshold to 3. I set threshold to 3 and then I just repeat the same command I had before. 
and then I just plot the table again. So now if you set it to 3, this is the result you will get and so on. And there is a construct called a for loop where you can say start with my threshold of 1 and go up to 10 and it will calculate this table automatically and print it for values from 1 to 10. So but I thought one should never use for loops in R. That's true. Yeah. That's the more complicated. <laughs> so yeah. th there is a way to do it without doing for loops in a single line of code. Yeah. And I think that's when you come for the advanced R yes. next time. Yeah. That's for, uh, yeah. So you are allowed to use for loops until next year. Yeah. <laughs> but after that, no more. I hope the session was informative for you all, where you learned some basics of R followed by the prediction analysis. Dr. Finio showed you how to set an optimal threshold and count the sample. We also learned how to color code the samples that is coming with high copy number. Further he showed you how binary classification model can be used to classify the elements of a given set into two groups. There are many matrices that can be used to measure the performance of a classifier or predictor. Different fields have provided different preferences for a specific matrices due to different goals. For example, for the clinical applications the sensitivity and specificity are often used. I will recommend you all to learn some basics of R that will help you a lot for doing the statistical analysis and prediction analysis very easily. There are many publicly available resources where various softwares, various codes are already available, but you at least need some basic ability to run those codes in R. In the next supplementary lecture, we will have uh, a TA for this course, Diptaru Biswas, who will discuss about pathway enrichment and network analysis. Thank you.